Wow, there's a lot of people in here. How is everyone's DrupalCon so far? Oh, it's five. Don't ask me to exhibit enthusiasm at five. There's two more premium seats in the front. Yep. If somebody's looking for extra leg room. They have extra extra leg room. They have power. And there's a table. Like it's still it's like. Of course, you will have to pay class. us three hundred dollars a piece in order to sit in. Although you may become an initiative lead if you sit there. So. Yeah. Also, if there is an emergency, we're going to ask you to open that door. And... <laughs> yeah, there are. There's there like seats. Boom, 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 boom. So you don't have to. We very rarely bite, only in special circumstances. Only when provoked. Yeah. And we got about two minutes. Although, a lot of people here. There are more people coming in. Um, so we got a few slides, but our intention here is to talk through them pretty f quickly. Hopefully not too quickly, and then leave lots of time for talky bits at this. Because the idea is this is a core conversation. And so, um, you know, we'd love to get your thoughts and ideas on everything that we talk about. Uh, the other thing I want to stress is, what we're going to present here is just a proposal about making proposals, meta. Um, and so none of this is set in stone. This is just some conversations that Gabor and I have been having with various folks like core committers and UX maintainers and these sorts of people just to try and you know, get some things addressed. So. Uh, OK. Shall we hit it? Yeah. Okay. We can do that. So. So this is the potential in Drupal 8 and how to realize it. And we've been thinking about how to, how to frame this conversation. And yeah, uh, we should explain <laughs> who we are. So this is NG Byron. And I'm Gabor Hoichi. And both of us work in the office of the CTO with Dries at Acquia. And both of our work in the Drupal community predates that several years. So we've been working on all kinds of crazy things. And I think we are both very passionate about making stuff happen in Drupal. And both the hard way and the even harder way, I guess. Because <laughs> yep. we still need to figure out the easy way. So, so that's why we are here today. And this is a core conversation once again, so we'll present some stuff and then we should talk and then I'll put back the mic once we don't need the two, of, two of the mics anymore. So the, the first thing that we wanted to talk about is Drupal 8, there's finally new possibilities that were never there before. So if you've been involved in Drupal 8's development, we spent four and a half years working on a new thing and there was two totally divergent code bases in Drupal 7 and Drupal 8. And what you worked on in Drupal 8 was not possible to reuse in Drupal 7, and there were a lot of those uh, problems there. But what we worked out instead now is now you can make big changes in Drupal 8. How? How? Oh. So Drupal 8 adopted semantic versioning, which the, the simplest way to explain is now our version numbers uh, make sense, and our version numbers allow to make changes that we used to not allow culturally before. So basically, the semantic versioning number scheme that Drupal adopted means that the first number in our version number 8 will change if we need to make backwards incompatible API changes in Drupal. However, uh, most things are possible to do without making those backwards incompatible API changes. So we can still introduce new APIs and introduce new features by incrementing the second version number. And we can make fixes by incrementing the third version number, the patch version number. So this is major, minor, and patch. I think it may be confusing at first because in the minor versions we can actually introduce huge changes. <laughs> but it's a minor version. Um, so huge changes in terms of user experience, but it, we still call it a minor version. That's how semantic versioning calls it. It's not something we made up. It's how semantic versioning calls it. And 
Uh, the other thing that we adopted is uh, scheduled releases. So we now have new minor releases about twice a year. And then we stopped supporting the previous one. So what you see there is we are in the middle of, uh, approaching the middle of May, and we are not supporting Drupal 8.0 anymore. So if you have a Drupal 8.0 site, you're not going to get updates to that anymore. However, we now have 8.1, and we support 8.1 until there's um, an 8.2, etc. So uh, we have timed releases, and we actually made our 8.1 the first time release on the date scheduled. First time in history. Woohoo! <laughs> so it's certainly possible to do. So Drupal 8 has a lot more potential in there than previous versions because we now culturally ex um, accepted this that we now are going to make big changes that are backwards compatible still. Yep. Yeah. So what, what does it help with? So for one thing, it's predictable in terms of what you work on, what can, what can you get into new versions, like there's rules to what's possible to do. It's also predictable in terms of when a new version is coming out. So if you work on something and it's committed to core, then you could be sure that it's going to be released at X time. And it's not like maybe in two years or three years or four years or sometime. Um, that's, that's not a problem anymore. Also, there are improvements coming every six months. So if you are a user, you can expect that Drupal is going to improve um, in, in, um, in several ways uh, twice a year. And we hope this incentivizes contribution a lot because now if you do something, you don't need to wait four years for, for your customers to use it and you don't need to wait four years for other companies to contribute to what you worked on and fix uh, issues there and, and uh, build on that as well. So it incentivizes you to work on core issues instead of just going into your own corner and figure out something one-off for your customers. And it's also backwards compatible, so it's easy to adopt these new changes. Uh, you can hop on the uh, new version and uh, start using it. Yeah, the only other thing I'd add there is, is even though the releases come out every six months, they get committed basically every day. So if you aren't launching a Drupal 8 site till after October, there's no reason you would use 8.1 right now at all. Just use the 8.2 dev branch, essentially, and you can get these improvements as they filter in and test them actively as it's being developed. So that by the time 8.2 ships, you know it has everything that you need in it. So. Yeah, so the question is what to even change, like what we want to do in the new releases. So now we have all this possibility, what do we use it for? And there are two ways that we're looking at this. There's one way is the top-down things, is like we should do this, that come from um, decisions that are made for, uh, made for by committers, for example. So we wanted to have a migrate user interface so that people can actually get off of Drupal 6 that we don't support anymore. Um, so that was a top-down goal that, that we communicated in, in uh, all kinds of posts at events and we rally people behind. And there's, uh, there's all kinds of other things like front-end testing or blocks and layouts that came from um, survey results, uh, configuration management, uh, media, workflow, et cetera. So these come from aggregated information that we see um, in the community and needs that we believe our um, users have. And then there's always uh, all kinds of great things that come up from people from their own initiative, from their own needs, from solving their own pains. Stuff like uh, Tweak this was not something that was planned top down. It came as a grassroots idea and then grew out very huge and very successful. And a lot of other things like the admin style guide, picture uh, support, uh, the current work to make contact forms um, better as a basic web form solution in core, et cetera. So these all come um, from the community and that's very valuable. And both of, both of them are very useful for making changes in Drupal core. Yeah. So, Angie created a page. Like six days ago. Six days ago <laughs> called drupal.org slash core slash roadmap. Ooh, it's the big word. So, so, so Drupal, so we used to pride ourselves for years of not having a roadmap. 
Um, but, but once we kind of want to say what to focus on, we want to have plans, we want to have budgets, we want to have teams, it's kind of hard to say we don't have a roadmap. Um, <laughs> Tell you what, you pay us lots of money to work for an unknown period of time on something with unmanageable scope for no payback whatsoever on an unknown timeline. Like, would you sign up for that? Probably not, which is why Acquia tends to be the only suckers who sign up for that. So we want to, like, <laughs> diversify this and let lots of people do things, and that's kind of the point of the talk. Yeah, no. So, so, um, so we set up this page to to um, have a place to figure out what are these things. So like we just had two slides, I told you about things, but, but a week from now, there's gonna be sprints here. People are gonna decide on new initiatives that they wanna work on. Um, we're gonna make plans for some of the initiatives and you wanna track, track what's available and, and what you can work on and what you can join. So this page is for you. So you can go there and see what's going on and um, and um, what's the status of different initiatives? So that's the goal. Yeah. But you might ask, how do we actually do that, right? How do we get changes on there? How do we not kill ourselves while we're getting changes into core? How do we actually make the most use out of this six-month release cycle that we have? Because I heard from so-and-so that it is awful working on core, and I never want to touch it with a 10-foot pole. For example, you may have heard of some of these pain points. And this is just a sampling of pain points from Drupal 7 and 8. Um, we have a lot of bike shedding, which means a lot of like nitpicking insignificant details that don't actually matter in the long scheme of things, particularly for user-facing changes. Um, people tend to just be like, yeah, whatever, if you want to make, say, a Q API, but if you want to change the color of the button on the node form, people have a lot of opinions about that. Um, a lot of developers have a lot of opinions about that, even though designers are saying, but Blue, anyway. Um, <laughs> um, even if you work really hard on something, even if you talk to people at the right times and all this kind of thing, it might still get rejected. So you could do months and months and months of work and at the end go like, ah, yeah, thanks, but no thanks. We decided to do a different direction for that, which that is scary as hell to anyone who wants to try and make something happen in core. Um, People often get the wrong feedback at the wrong time. So you're looking for like directional or architectural feedback on your idea and instead you get like your white space and it just really is demoralizing. Um, often we don't validate our ideas until after they've already shipped and often after it's too late to do anything about them. We spend months and months and months going around and around on a patch in the queue, which is great for the four people who know about that issue, but when the rest of the community gets to actually try that thing isn't until it's committed, and often if that issue got to 300 comments, everyone just walks away like very frustrated and they don't ever go back and iterate on that thing. Um, and then after it's shipped, we can't really, ch we're, we're much more locked down on what we can do. Um, and then we had a lot of workflow problems, so some people went the giant core patch route, which has that pros and cons, and that it's, it's visible to the core contributors, but it is really hard to find just random issues in the queue if you don't know what's what. Sandboxes, which are great in that they're, you know, like isolated, you can work a lot faster there, but they have really obscure URLs and, you know, uh, again, that you don't get the visibility from the core committers and they might come in at the last minute and be like, what are you doing even? And, and there's a lot of sync up there. You know, put, doing stuff in contrib is great because people can use it right away. It's got a nice URL, but then the risk is it might stay in contrib because it never quite makes all the gauntlets that are required to get into core. And then doing things in core itself is awesome in that you get the peer review aspects, but you, do, you know, it's very slow. And so it can be frustrating to work in there. Um, so when we want to talk about things that we want to do to the process to improve upon those pain points, we want to do what other people do and iterate quickly and cheaply on ideas. We don't want to build big cathedrals in a patch in the issue queue. We want to get things out as quickly and cheaply as possible so that we know what's going on what. We want clear sign-off points to avoid wasting time. If I'm going to be told no about my idea, I want to know that like when it's three sentences long. Not after I've written a core patch and gotten the nit, you know, the white, sta white space standards nitpicked and everything. I don't want to find out my idea is bad at that point. That, that's really awful for people's morale. Um, we don't want surprises, right? We don't want like the entity system maintainer not to be looped into the fact that you rewrote the entity system, right? That's not fun either. So we want to make sure that the right people know what's going on at the right time. 
Um, we want to make sure committers are involved so they know what's going on because they can say no to everything. So it'd be good if they said no right away. Um, we want to reduce barriers to entry for new ideas and also we want that clear visibility in, into priorities because a huge problem we had for the last six months is we did communicate some priorities but it kind of happened once in a groups at Drupal.org core post so if you know that you channel you would have seen it probably if you were there that week but you know th there's, there was never like this central resource to find that kind of stuff. I wanted to talk briefly about what other people do when they improve products. So this is this book, The Lean Startup, which everyone in the Acquia leadership team had to read. And to be honest, the author is really, he thinks highly of himself, let's put it that way. Um, <laughs> however, it has some really good uh, parts in it. And one of them is this thing, which is basically, you, it, it's this loop that you go around where you build something, you measure it, and then you learn from what you measured. And you try and go around that loop as quickly as possible and as cheaply as possible. And he has a lot of examples in the book, but the one that sticks with me is uh, Dropbox. Like people have probably heard of Dropbox, maybe. So their first version was a video and they totally MacGyvered this video. Like they had no working code, nothing, but they like shot this video like with all these like faking that things were actually happening that they wanted to do. And they just put up the video and an email sign up box. That's it. And then within like a week, they had like a million signups or whatever, and that validated that their idea had promise. They were able to turn around and go to a VC and say, please give us $70 billion or whatever, and they were like, sure, you know. So that, but, so instead of spending 18 months writing this thing and hoping that it had promise, they validated the idea right at the beginning so they knew that people would think it was valuable. Um, so trying to find cool hacks like that where we can do less work find out that we're in a good direction, and then invest the, the time and resources. So, so this is kind of what Gabor, Yoroi, Boyan, and I have come up with, sort of incorporating some of that lean UX methodology, but then um, you know, also taking into consideration that we're a community, people flit in and out, you know, we, we want to maintain the volunteerism aspect of Drupal. Um, and it goes from an idea, which generates a plan, to a prototype, which generates a spec, to building a thing, then you ship the thing, in something called an experimental module, which I'll talk about in a second. And then you refine it a few times, and then when you feel good about it again, then you go through all the core gates, like documentation, usability, accessibility, all those kinds of things, and then it goes into core as a stable module where it kind of, you know, goes into just like, we just basically maintain it at that point. We don't make radical changes anymore. Um, so I want to emphasize that this is just a proposal, like this is just our ideas, and, and it might look more fleshed out than it actually is, but these are just, I wanted to kind of stimulate the conversation, you know, so we, we had something to talk about. So the idea is from idea to prototype. An idea is just a few sentences. If we use lean UX here, it would be a hypothesis. We say, we think that improving media support in Drupal would be a good thing to do, and we will know this because um, whatever reason, you know, that kind of thing. And so the idea is like, Formulate your use case around an actual user. So say content authors will benefit from this because they will now be able to just click a button to add an existing media thing as opposed to opening a page and grabbing a URL and pasting that into a thing and, you know, and this kind of stuff. Um, and then you also talk about how you're going to validate that idea that it actually works. Um, you can get sign up for rejection on your idea right away before you've done any work. You just say, this is my idea, and we go, awesome, or mm, maybe in contrib, or whatever. But at this point, you haven't invested a lot, so that's a great time to get a yes or no answer. And then in order to get to the next phase, then you formulate a plan. And a plan will have things like, you know, what are the goals, what are the milestones that you want to break that out into, because we want to kind of force people to think about that. Like, this thing has to happen first, second, third, maybe target some, you know, release milestones for it, maybe not, but the idea is, like, we don't want just big bullet points Content workflow, that's what we're gonna have, because it's like, what does that even mean? So it's about breaking it out and so people understand what that means, what's gonna happen in what order, so that people can look at that and say, oh, I can totally help with that thing, and that sort of stuff, so. Um, here's a plan template, it's kind of in beta version that Jess came up with. Um, so it's got some of the fields, including sign-offs and some other things that would be the kind of thing that you'd fill out, and uh, I think the content workflow initiative has done this as a, as a starting point. Um, one thing I just want to throw in here, this is from Yoroi's presentation earlier, but when we talk about these minimum viable products that we want to be churning out every six months, ideally, they would not be, you know, just a layer of API things 
you know, that are really great if you happen to use that thing as a developer, that idea would be something that goes up this entire pyramid. Because oftentimes we add APIs and then we don't actually do any, we don't go up the pyramid at all. Like we have this great revision system in Drupal 8 that allows you to differentiate the active revision from other revisions, you know, so you can ideally do like drafts and stuff, but there's no UI for it because we just never got around to that, you know. So ideally, we would go down this slice of the pyramid and we would be, you know, putting out MVPs that also have a user-facing component because we know that content authors and site builders are sort of a more important audience there. So. Just something to think about. When we go from prototype to build, uh, we want to prototype iteratively as cheaply as possible. I'm talking like I drew this on a napkin, took a picture of it with my phone, and uploaded it to the issue queue. Start there. Um, validate the prototype with real users. So you know, actually sit down with people and show them. Maybe you know, walk through the thing. Once the validation occurs and people are satisfied with that, then the prototype becomes a spec, and we stop talking about it until it ships. No more bike shitting at this phase. Yay! Uh, so here's some example of prototypes. People do paper prototypes. Purely HTML, JavaScript, CSS, fine. We don't do core patches at this stage because core patches have a whole lot of overhead on them. The idea is simple, manageable as possible. You can do core patches. There's nothing wrong with that, I'm just saying. Um, idea is really cheap. Doesn't have to integrate with Drupal. Um, this is a really scary looking slide. <laughs> this is a, I'm trying to lay out our core governance process, which is, um, you know, it's, it's a thing. <laughs> um, we used to have a problem though where people didn't know who to talk to and then oftentimes people would be surprised or people would feel lost. We actually have a structure around this now, which is kind of new in Drupal 8. So we have um, initiative coordinators, subsystem maintainers, topic maintainers, and committers. So and so then, this is existing, is already exists. Yes. It's not a proposal. Correct. This exists currently. Yeah. And then within committers and all these things, you have different sort of buckets in there. So committers are product managers, framework managers, release managers, topic maintainers are like testing performance documentation and so on uh, and so forth like that. Um, these are some of the people you may need to involve in your thing. And we can work with you to help you figure out for your particular idea who needs to sign off on that. But in general, if you're proposing a typo fix, you don't need to talk to anybody. You just do your typo fix. If you're talking about um, radically changing, say, the node edit form, which is a very user-facing form that almost everyone uses, then you're probably going to have to talk to a lot of people. You're probably going to have to talk to a committer, probably going to have to talk to the usability maintainer, um, the node system maintainer, this kind of thing. So, um, you know, based on that. But the idea with the governance stuff is you now have a map, so you know what the community looks like and you know who to talk to about your proposed changes. When we go to build it and then we go to ship it, um, now we turn that prototype into a core patch. Um, however, we bypass either most, or I would argue for all, but I would probably get stabbed, so maybe just most. Um, core gates are bypassed. We don't nitpick white space. Okay? We don't necessarily like slap you on the head if you don't have all the things documented and that kind of stuff. Um, the goal is to get something workable in core as quickly as possible so that it has the visibility and people can use it, but we clearly mark that thing as experimental because we know it's not ready yet. And so the benefit of this, as opposed to doing something in contrib, is in order to do something in trib, there's, there needs to be visibility. So you need to know the URL to get to the page because Drupal.org search sucks. So you can't actually find the views module. You have to know it's project slash views. And then, um, you know, we, we, if we're targeting this stuff for core, it makes sense to put it in core anyway. And then people who want to be on the bleeding edge know one particular section of the modules page to check things off of, and it's really nice that way. And then we open up the bike shedding on the design again after shipping it, because now lots more people have tried it. We get a lot of feedback on that, and we can do this even in point releases, um, which is great. Why experimental modules over, you know, contrib or other things? Uh, the pros are that it's already in core, so you don't need to go out and download a thing. Um, it's clearly marked that it's going to be less stable, so we can bend the rules that we normally have for core modules with those. You can use a familiar core process. You get to benefit from things like peer review, that kind of thing. Um, it's easy for end users to find it because it's all in one place. And because they're experimental, it allows us to iterate quickly. The cons are you still can't commit directly. If you start a contrib module, you can commit whatever you want. Um, you do need reviewers for that thing. That's why we emphasize initiative teams as opposed to lone wolves trying to get things done. Um, it's always best to team up with at least one other person. 
Um, System-wide changes are not really possible. Like it's hard to affect the entire system with just a module. Um, and then there's risk of lingering technical debt. We did put an accessibility improvement module in 8.0 called inline form errors and that's just kind of set there because uh, people kind of burnt out during the process of that and haven't ever got back to it. So there's pros and cons, but in general, I'm really excited about this because it allows us to keep all of our existing tools and workflows that we benefit from um, while also giving us the visibility and, and things like that that we need. And then finally, this last bit. So after we've gone around that loop a few times and we feel good about this, now we move it to a proper core module. And here is where we make sure that every bit of that is unit tested. We make sure that all the documentation gates pass, the accessibility, usability, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then uh, we move it into core stable. At this point, the only way to make radical changes to this again is to just go through the whole loop again from scratch, which is fine. We can always make a better blah, blah, blah module as an experimental module and keep going. Um, but the idea is uh, that that's now locked down, improvements are no longer possible, and uh, enjoy, because now you have a stable, awesome core module that does really neat stuff. Okay, so in summary, what the process, whatever it is that we come up with, is intended to do is to get sign-off or rejection early on in the process before you've done a whole bunch of work. We want to validate that direction with real-world users before we write a bunch of code. Um, and uh, we want to base that on data versus just arguing with each other a lot. Um, we want to make it cheaper, faster, easier, et cetera, to improve core all around, and this experimental module paradigm lets us do that. And we do want to jump through the right hoops because we have hoops in core for a reason, security, all kinds of things, but the idea is let's jump through the right hoops at the right time. And then somewhere down the line, profit! So, hooray. Um, yeah, so what do you think? So we have a few prepared bullet points. These are just ideas for structuring the conversation, but really we're just looking for um, feedback, yay, nay, horror, whatever, you know, whatever you got for us. I'm, I'm very happy that you're thinking about this uh, because I do think that it's been one of the sore points of uh, development for, for core. Uh, but even going to the very first stage where the ideas are being discussed, I'm worried that that will get bogged down. 10 different people will have 10 different ideas and nothing will really get resolved and no particular direction will ever get chosen. And it will just sort of fester that way. Sorry, I'm trying to find that slide. There it is. Um, you're saying right at the idea yeah, stage it exactly. could get bogged down. So the nice thing that the governance uh, process gives us is we now have uh, people defined with roles to be able to say whether or not things are a good idea. So even if there are heated opinions about a thing, at the end of the day a committer makes a call here. Um, and if it's a frameworky feature, then a framework manager will make the call. If it's a user-facing feature, then a product manager will make the call. Um, but we have a clearly defined, and what they're going to want to do is they're going to want to let the discussion bake for a little while because they're going to want to see what the opinions are of people because sometimes people are kind of a pain in the ass, but they have a good point and it, their feedback is, is still worth taking into consideration. Um, and I think what you'd find is that, you know, what we plan to do is set up some kind of a process like say a monthly or bi-weekly, I don't know yet, meeting where these ideas are gone through in a sequence and we validate them or, or invalidate them or whatever so that it's time boxed to an extent. Um, because yeah, I agree with you. You don't want to like let things fester for 300 comments. That's just not a good thing. So the idea is time boxing this step and making sure there's clearly delineated decision makers for, for each phase of this, this process. Great, thank you. Yep. Also, the ideas would not come just out of the blue, I think. So there's, so Drupal has some, some like, I mean, if we set high level goals for Drupal to achieve, like if we want, a, want to be API first, then if you have ideas that totally go against that, that they will just not, not be compatible with what Drupal go, Drupal's goals are. So if we set some of those high level goals, then a lot of those ideas will be um, objectively judgeable on that level. And then there's, a, it will be down to more, more of implementation details, I guess, in terms of how do you want to get there. I think it would just be important to have a, uh, a maintainer say, uh, uh, saying, uh, I'm sorry, but no, rather than just letting it peter yeah. out and nothing ever yep. being said. Yep. Yep. Hey, a uh, question about the experimental module model. 
Um, so I'm just thinking about uh, like a suggestion Dries had in his keynote of wouldn't it be great uh, if you could place a block by just looking at the page and think, just sitting thinking about how we would implement that like a minimum viable mm -hmm. implementation that would probably be great to have an experimental module. Mm -hmm. but once it works, I'd just want that to be in the block module. And how do you foresee us kind of iterating on these minimum viable things and then the, then integrate, is it going to be possible to actually just do away with the experimental module and integrate the feature into other parts of core? Yeah, that's a great question. We talked about this a little bit at uh, uh, whatever DrupalCon it was, Barcelona maybe, with Ketch, and he had a great idea which was, um, yeah, so you might eventually get that experimental module to the point where it's like, well, why would we even use the old crappy version of that? So his idea was copy and paste the old module into block underscore legacy module, put an update hook that automatically enables that module on any site that had block module enabled, and then make the new block module the default um, for all new sites. Um, and then, you know, promote it in the release notes as something that you can now turn on yourself. Um, there's probably some implementation goofiness with that, but in general, the, the idea though is we want to make it so that Drupal 9 becomes just RMRF anything that's legacy. Um, and if they're intermixed, it's really going to be difficult to do that. There's, you know, there, there's some different things there, like we don't want to get into a situation where we have a security problem and now we have to fix it at three places in the code, so I don't know exactly, but the idea though is we want to make it really easy in Drupal 9 when we can break BC to go ahead and do that without um, affecting much. So I guess, yeah, I was even thinking more of something that was experimental in terms of a U, UI or UX improvement. So it's not really a BC breaking change, but mm -hmm. it might be something you want to ship as experimental so people can try it and get that broader feedback. Uh, so do you see it as possible as like, okay, we're gonna overhaul or add a, a bunch of block you know, UI features to the existing block module not breaking any APIs. Yeah, I guess it would it would depend. Like we have to be careful with that because it will instantly invalidate all documentation and videos and everything else for Drupal 8 to that point. So for something like blocks, I would be a little hesitant. Like I'd rather have the like a fork. Um, you know, where there's the old way and the new way. But for something like you know, but maybe we just are like, the old block UI is honestly so terrible that everyone's gonna be fine with having out of date documentation. I think it'd be kind of a case by case thing. So there's a number of pages that I would be fine just changing it right in the module and not worry about it. But block, node, anything that's like a major site building UI, it's a little, I don't know. Pers that's my personal view, but other committers may disagree. Yeah, that's there's not just an idea because in Drupal 7 we have profile module that is not this hidden for you if you, if you yeah. install Drupal 7 new. If you've upgraded from Drupal 6, then profile module is there for you to use, but if you install new, it's hidden. Yeah. So we already did this in Drupal 7, it's not a new idea. And, and in this case, we'll just like put in new shiny things into core and we'll need to figure out on a, I think on a case by case basis because there may be modules that extend the blocks page and provide new features and all kinds of other things that, that then may become incompatible and all of those questions of how we define the API in terms of that. And on that note to Peter's question, um, I'm XJM by the way, I'm one of the Drupal 8 release managers. Um, we, we have this concept in core of disruption that we don't make disruptive changes in patch releases. We make disruptive changes in minor releases carefully and conscientiously. <laughs> so like when, whenever we talk about a big change, the, the disrupt, well any patch actually, the, the potential disruption to all of the different use cases is something that the core committers take into account, which is why being a core committer is, is hard and why we have so few of them compared to the, the breadth of the contributor base because we want to make sure all those things. So we, we would make, if we were making that change, we would take, we would look really, really carefully, okay, what are the impacts? How many contrib modules, APIs are completely broken if we completely release the blocks UI? But we have the opportunity, like Angie pointed out, to do it iteratively over the course of minor releases. So we have an allowed changes page on Drupal.org. Can you maybe pull this up? Oh, you sure. have more experience with. I'm gonna mirror the screen then. screen typing in the well. It's drupal.org slash core slash d8 hyphen allowed hyphen changes. Not See. that I type this URL every day. <laughs> what was it, I'm sorry? Slash core slash d8 hyphen. Not d7. Oh. Oh. Allowed hyphen changes. 
Just a little like throwback, 2011, hey? Eh? Okay. So that's all the details. So th this, this page goes into details about what we allow, what types of changes we allow in patch re releases, minor releases, major releases, as well as the beta and RC phases. And then there's a specific subpage of this under, um, th that will outline in, in excruciating detail whether or not your change to your markup in this in Bartik versus stable, or whether this particular kind of method on this particular kind of interface and is disruptive or not, and what will change and make about it. So it is painfully well defined, and it, it it's so far it's working well. The problem is that you know it's again this is not something that you can just keep in your head unless you have to do it all the time. No. But it's useful and it's there as a reference, so we can actually do these things. So um, I'm actually going to make the point to the forget who the first person who came up and made the point about um, the, at the idea phase, the risk of bike shedding ideas and the fact that we need to be willing to say no in a timely fashion. Um, the, we actually have an example of this in the Drupal community that's already starting to work well on the most bike sheddable possible topic, which is coding standards. There is nothing more bike sheddable than coding standards. Okay. And the okay. technical working group has, I, I, okay, the usability maintainer is contesting my assertion, but um, the technical working group has um, implemented a process where on a, on, a, on a time frame, the proposals get discussed for a little bit. They look over the proposals on like a monthly meeting and say, okay, we think these proposals have enough to su support to be wider for wider community discussion. And then the discussion's open for two weeks, and then at the end of that time box, they close it and they make a decision at that point. So there's, there's I think, two weeks to where you can say whatever you want and then they make a call and that their call is either advanced to the next phase where it gets um, committer sign off and, and approval or they say no and the issue is closed forever and, and sorry your coding standard is not implemented. So that, that's the kind of thing that we could implement for these idea issues. We, we'd obviously um, need a process to, to find and surface them which is one of the pieces that's still missing like how do we get these plans mm -hmm. into that, that idea phase without it being a lot of overhead. Um, the technical working group is doing it through, like they have just one issue queue that they have to worry about and all they have to do is make sure the issues get into that queue and they meet about it. The core committers also meet on like a bi-weekly basis and also communicate synchronously 24 hours a day, kind of. Um, but like we, we do, that's the process that we would still need to develop. I'm curious, do they, do they use a separate project, like a coding standards yeah, project? The, the yeah, I was thinking of a separate like Drupal core ideas. So it's like completely separate, so it's very clear, if it's in there, don't work on it yet unless you want to take on the risk. It, there's benefits and, and cons that we got set, but it's just like, because otherwise I worry we'd have to come up with a tag and then that's like inscrutable yeah, to that's, new that people. Was my default and assumption. I know, so <laughs> anyway, I was, just, I was just curious how they did that. Cool. Yeah, I mean, first let me say this looks fantastic. I'm really excited to see where it Yay. goes. Yay! Uh, that's awesome. Uh, yeah. You want to pull up the mic? So oh, yeah, sure. I'll... Sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I, I, like I said, I think it all gr looks great, but have you got into thinking about um, how you might mitigate feature bloat mm -hmm. with keeping, you know, allowing these new things to come in? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, yeah, because what we could end up with is, um, great, now core ships with three, 37 experimental modules and none of them have been touched in two years, you know. So one thing I was thinking of is in that plan issue, um, one of the headings, if it isn't already, which you would know Jess, but um, is uh, what are the steps required to get this to a stable state? So that could be issues like finish off unit testing or whatever it is, plus a, a milestone deadline for that. So for something like migrate UI, we want to might want to give that to like 8.5 or something because that's a really critical piece of infrastructure. Or maybe we just don't give it a milestone at all. We say even though this is kind of ah, like it needs to be there, so we're just going to, you know. But a new feature like say the accessibility module that currently isn't being maintained, we could set a deadline of 8.2 for that. And we could say, look, if, if no one comes to improve this by 8.2, then I'm sorry, it's going to go and contrib. And that's fine, like it's still usable by people, there's, there's no implications for upgrade paths because it's got the same name and everything, but it would allow, um, you know, it, it would allow for us to reduce scope of core to just the feature set that we want. Um, the idea though is like, we, we're not gonna open experimental modules for any harebrained idea anyone has. Like it's gotta go through, you know, a, an approval process, that's the idea. And, and the only things we're going to put into core most likely are gonna be things that have some kind of a 
data to back up that these would be good core features that you know 60 to 80 percent of our site you know users are going to want you know um, or are something so strategically important like big pipe I don't know that anyone would be like yeah I want that but we know that that's something really valuable that they don't know they want because they you know like then you tell them it's it's faster pages they're like oh yeah I want that you know kind of thing like that so um, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. But you know, so but it's a it's a good thing that we're going to have to manage for sure. But the idea is, and the other thing that that Jess uh, frequently says is we should also limit the scope per minor release and kind of say like, I'm sorry, this minor release is full. Like we've got content workflow going, we've got some media things, and da 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 da. If you've got your cool idea, feel free to work on it wherever sandbox, core patch, whatever. But um, but we're going to target it for 8.3 instead because 8.2 is bursting at the seams. We don't have that problem right now, I don't feel anyway. So feel free to work on whatever you'd like. But yeah, the, the idea is like these things would be mostly important strategic things. We don't want to make every effing bug fix and minor thing go through this workflow. The idea is this workflow is for really important things that we want to like feature in the release notes, if that makes sense. Cool. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So there's one scary part here for me. And that's moving the gates to the end. Yes. Um, uh, the most scary thing is that uh, testing is a gate, and I think testing would be super. Tests will be super important to have in this loop. In the experimental so phase. So I'm wondering if you really mean gates here, or if you mean nitpicking, because a lot of like um, <laughs> criticism that well, stop touching the mic. The, a lot of the criticism that I think we can get in core patches isn't actually a gate. But we end up fixing it anyway because we're compulsive about things and it bothers us. So I'm wondering if this is not gates at the end, but like polish. And if we can keep gates in the, in the loop. I don't think it's polish. I mean, there's, you certainly would not like ignore the security gate. It's like, oh, here's a here's an experimental module that makes your site insecure. Um, uh, we don't want to do that intentionally, definitely. Uh, so I don't think it's all the gates. We need to define what gates you need to meet to be like to be included. But I don't think you need to meet all the gates because it's not just polish or not just nitpicking. I I would say no. So some of the gates. Yeah, like maybe. Maybe we, we could say kind of it's, it, you have to have at least some test coverage for the major things your module does, but we do not need comprehensive unit testing of every effing function in there until later or something. It could be minimal gates. This is just a proposal. But the idea is we want to be able to get a thing. If we've gone through the work of getting a prototype that's been validated and we know this is going to make Drupal better, we want to get everything out of the way of getting in that into core as fast as possible so that we can then iterate on it and move it into proper core. Yeah, and I guess that just includes that you have to have tests. Yeah, I think test is the one gate that probably will stick well, around for that. So, so it, there, there's, it, there's a useful, like, maybe shifting our concept a little bit. The, I think that, um, so there's, there's, this, there's a healthy balance that we have between the, the product managers like Angie and um, the release management who uh, are part of like pushing back and saying, well, no, actually, we do need this functionality in order to ship um, a sufficiently stable experimental module. Because like experimental modules, we, we will not commit stuff that will introduce data integrity problems, even if it is experimental. We will not com commit stuff that introduces security problems. So those things that would be like fundamentally critical problems, we don't go there. And I think that MVP test coverage is part of the requirement for getting something as a stable thing, like Angie was saying, to the minimum case. MVP documentation, you can't like have no documentation whatsoever for the thing. And so I, it, it's more about, um, but the, it's not also limited to the core gates. There's Part of, part of creating one of these plans and what makes them effective is you have someone who's, who's like for a big initiative, owning the initiative and actively managing the scope. And so when something comes up in the process of reviewing the issue, if they're like, we don't, we're not gonna discuss this here, immediately, nope, that's gonna be part of making it stable. We're removing that from the discussion here and move that to the scope of the follow-up discussion, put it in the later part of the plan. Um, so it, it's not just like a, a binary list. It's an active process of defining, um, especially for big changes, what is really the most fundamental thing we need to do versus what work can we do later um, to, to make the work that we do now the most benefit for the least cost. That's it. So in other words, what I'm hearing 
as in some ways we formalized. So before we did commit stuff to core that was not fully baked. And we said, here are the follow-up issues that need to be resolved. And then those may or may not have been resolved at the end. So in some ways, we are actually formalizing that now. And we are saying that you only get the stable stamp if you actually resolve those follow-up issues. Mm -hmm. And then, then, then whatever gets the stable stamp, you can now be assured that the, those follow-up issues were actually resolved. Okay. So that's, that's a benefit for for both the quality of whatever comes with core and the and the users uh, knowing what comes is good. So the the iterative process is is is, is awesome, and you know we had needed. Kevin, could you step time. a little closer to the mic? Sorry, um, and and yeah, and we need it. We needed it a long time ago, but um, uh, I'm I'm not sure that I I'm, I might be missing. The, uh, fact here, but are we are we saying that the that the um, experimental modules only go in every six months? They will only be released every six months, yeah. but they go in during any open development cycle. So right now, if we were to commit an experimental module, it go into eight point two, um, and then users would see that benefit immediately if they're using dev releases or in in October if they're oh, using oh, core releases. But we do release we release security releases. So we could theoretically put an experimental module if it's only experimental anyway. So what we've talked about is you can add, you can't add or remove major functionality in a patch release because people expect patch releases to be very easy to upgrade to. We need to be so people aren't scared to do security updates. But, so, oh, go ahead. So this is not something inflicted on us from the outside. We decided to do uh, these minor releases every six months that can, make these, that can introduce these new things. We could decide to make new minor releases every three months, but we did not believe that we can deliver enough value every three months for you to, uh, to, to endure updating for the new minor release. And so we wanted to have a minor release that is well tested enough, had, the, had time for beta testing, RC releases, uh, quality assurance, had some of these things, not, not just as prototypes, but as somewhat more baked, like those kind of things. But and we, we could still get this in front of people even in the development phase. We don't need to, like, right. we don't need to deliver them to actual customer sites uh, right, out of, uh, right in the prototype phase. That wouldn't be true. It's just that it, six months isn't a very nimble iterative cycle. <laughs> That's what. So, so we did actually discuss, Kevin, the proposal you're talking about. We had a, like, over the course of, um, the, like, 8.1 was both developing 8.1 and developing the process we would use for future miners. And we did discuss in a lot of detail um, whether, uh, whether we could add new experimental modules in patch releases because they were experimental. The compromise we settled on is we don't add new ones, but we do make significant changes to experimental modules that are already added every patch release. So that's where the iteration comes in. Um, and and that, that's, that's the compromise that we came up with that balances all of the different concerns in between release management and, and the, the quick innovation that's there. So, so, so a new version of a current experimental module can, can be Every two out. weeks. So yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, for example, so, the big pipe right. module right now was added in 8.1. We couldn't, we wouldn't have added that in 8.02, even though, like, I think it was ready around 8.03 or 8.04. But um, we now, uh, if if there's significant changes that that need to be made to that module based on the user testing that's already happening of it, if we need to make even API changes to it, if the user interface needs a complete overhaul because it's it's causing problems, we can deliver that immediately in the next patch release in 8.2. So, or 8.1.2, excuse me. Also, I want to give some credit for what we did. So we moved from 4.5 years to six months. <laughs> <laughs> and, and thank you, thank you for making that happen. So, so, if, so, so this is already a huge change. So if we find this is too slow, then we can further change the process later on. I think it's already a pretty ambitious change compared to what we've had before. Um, so we need to try this out and see how it works. Well, I think it's better that we can, that, that at least the changes to the experimental modules can go in and, and iterate every two weeks. Yep. Um, but I, we probably will get a, like an Oklahoma land rush for experimental <laughs> modules every six months, 
like we used to get, you know, in, in major releases as well, where everyone wants to shove their new module in. That's so. why we have scheduled beta and releases and candidate phases also, so that, that that is planned. Not eliminating the beta. Yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm Dixon, the coordinator for the workflow initiative. Awesome stuff. Really good things. Can we get an MVP implemented of this? <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's beautiful. Uh, yes, I would love to do that. Do you have ideas? Because I agree. I look at this and I'm like, ah, it's a lot of steps. And yeah. I don't know. What, like, do you have specific suggestions? So I think the devil is going to be in the details here. Uh -huh. uh, so can we get like a buff or something scheduled this week where we sort of flush down some of the details here? Because for me, it's a cool. Yeah, because yeah. I, I see lots of use cases for, for already a big team uh, that wants to like get away and work on stuff right now. And there's a lot of issues in core that we could start using this for, I think. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, and, and like exactly what are the gates that we can pass or like what are the gates that we can compromise on? Uh, white space, this, that, testing. UA, like, yeah, white space. Yeah, no, 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 but like, coding no, standards no, is a gate, though. So it's part of documentation. No, basically, no, as, as yeah. I totally <laughs> think I, it is, and I worked on that stuff, but it's been a few years. I would basically just want the list of things that I could hold people to saying, no, you can't hold us back from you yeah. know, getting this to move forward. I want like something concrete to look at. Um, so that would be really cool if. Could okay. Do this right. um, probably you need at least a few core committers for that yeah. discussion, and um, I can't be here for that. Not that you need me, really. I'm pretty useless. But um, <laughs> uh, can you make it though? Mostly, it depends yeah. on the time, yeah. Uh, that's that would be there. He's the initiative coordinator for Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We'll, we'll figure something out. I'm okay, sure. anyway, but uh, plus one to meeting yeah. this week to hammer out some details with a scenario. Yeah, to get an MVP of this. I also need to, like, figure out if other core committers are necessarily on board with this yeah. idea. But it sounds like at least, you know, a few of them are. So yeah. that's good. One more thing. Um, so would this also apply for not only modules that also have UI components, but could we also do, like, API-level additions yes. in just modules? Yes, um, yes. And the second thing is uh, we can even do prototyping on API modules. Something I would love to see us do culturally is when we're about to make an API change, we write the fucking documentation for what that's gonna look like for end users, end users, developers. Because CMI did that, like very early on, we were whiteboarding like config, arrow, save, config, arrow, delete, config. Like having that level, it doesn't have to be like extensive API, but like a prototype of like, this is what the API would look like and here's how to call it, I think would be amazing because then we could see that ahead of time. And then we don't, you know, end up with like, oh, now we have Symphony, what? You know, <laughs> so, you know, like that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, so I think totally. We can do prototyping that way. We can also um, ship API improvements as experimental modules, and that's even better because then a module, if it wants to use your new API, just adds a dependencies line and they're done. And it's not kind of an issue that we might have like a bazillion modules that are just API things. I guess there's a line we need to draw. That, yeah, I mean, we could also hide those in the user interface, like, and they right. only turn on when someone needs, like, that's a module declares it as a dependency. Yeah. So there, there are ways around that. But. Thanks. Also for, for the MVP or, why, or if it's implemented or why didn't we implement it. So I think when we, st when we started putting this session together, we were like, geez, this is a very complicated process. It looks very scary. It's like, oh, you, I just want to write a patch and now I need to go through this, ah, I need to get approvals or everything and whatever. And it looks very scary at first. But if you think about, yeah, I can sit down and write that patch in five weeks and then it gets rejected and then I wasted five weeks. And because I didn't talk to people, and now who do I talk to? And who, who's going to tell me if it's OK or not? So it, is, it, it looks like a lot of process, but it's actually going to save you time, hopefully. So um, we wanted to get this into that perspective and then figure out what, what people think about that. And if they think that it's actually going to save them time or if it's going to be painful and a lot of process. So that's why we brought it here. So all of this looks looks great. I, I have uh, one reservation. So from what I understand, you're saying if I download like Drupal 8.4 or something, 
Like there'll be a bunch of uh, core modules and a bunch of core experimental modules. They'll all be there together. Uh, um, I've I've noticed that in Contrib, for example, there are lots of there are modules that are very heavily used that have never had a stable release ever. There's just some developer engine. Everyone knows you've got to use that, and it just spins like every couple of weeks or something. Mm -hmm. uh, but everyone needs that functionality, so they use that. I I suspect that what might happen is that somebody will write some really cool uh, core experimental module, and then their energy will peter out, uh, and then but and it'll have some I don't know like it kills performance in X situation, and so it can't possibly go into core stable. So it's sitting there, but you've got all these people using it, uh, and but no one's really maintaining it because those people walked away because it's been six months or whatever. So then what? Because uh, like that's a that's a I consider that a really serious problem with um, Drupal uh, Contrib, for example, because then if there's no stable release, that means you've got no security support. Mm -hmm. So would there be security support for experimental module? I'm guessing no. Yes. Yes. Sir. yes. Really? Yes. Oh, oh. Okay. It's in core. Something new every day. It's in core. Okay, so there would be, but but yeah, that. Do you have uh, do you have an idea of how to manage, like avoid that that pitfall with these, these modules? So we cannot command people to work on stuff. Uh, if they don't work on it, the NG explained this scenario that we set a deadline for when it's going to get to stable. And if it's not making that deadline, then sorry, but it's going to go to contrib. And then people can still use it from contrib later on if they want to, but it's not going to be in core anymore. So it will be removed? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, then we already have a similar situation with inline form errors right now in core where it's not really maintained and it's languishing there and we'll need to figure out what okay. happens with that. So the, the plan is uh, you tell people it'll be ripped out in two months unless you fix it and if not, it'll be in contrib. Yeah, it's fine if, if you don't have, I mean, months, people should not kill well, themselves X over. Months, X months, we'll give them more warning. Yeah, yeah. yeah, no, no, <laughs> like I, I'm assuming you'll, you'll, there'll be a, I don't know, a policy document somewhere that says you've got this law. Well, it'll be early in this process. So it'll be yeah. precise. Okay. No, that, that answers, that, that sounds Yeah, it's like part of the plan is the, the deadline. Great. Yeah. Um, and I guess, you know, for, for you as an end user, though, um, you're pretty well unaffected. You can still, it's not like the code goes away and vanishes. It's just it moves to contrib instead. Yeah, yeah. And then you just have the same problem you already have in contrib, which is it's probably going to be a dev release and never really go anywhere. But, but, and I already have that. You already have that problem, yeah. yeah. Now we just are, we're just <laughs> generating more of that problem. <laughs> but hopefully most of these will end up on the other side because, yeah. you know, only people who are pretty frickin' motivated are gonna even start on this, I'm thinking. And, go through one. and yeah, and then the idea is hopefully with the refinements and the fewer gates, we burn people out a lot less than we used to. That's the goal. Yeah, that, that all sounds great. Yeah, so even so, we cannot guarantee you that even stable core modules are well maintained, right? So, <laughs> so promising that experimental modules will be well maintained is even even less responsible. So, uh, I mean, people should not kill themselves over these things, and if they need to go away, they should go away, and they take their time. I think that's fine, and then we'll figure out what happens. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm Dave, and I'll speak a little bit as an infrequent uh, maintainer of docs and say that, the, that particularly if you do this experimental thing with APIs, it presents an interesting challenge associated with how to advertise api.drupal.org, which is already getting a little bit complicated with the new 8.0, 8.1, 8.2, and stuff like that. So uh, I'm really kind of interested in how we might think about that a little bit differently as part of this because flagging something as experimental is a great idea, but it also needs to flow into the documentation so that people know what experimental APIs are versus vetted APIs that are going to move forward. Uh, th that, that being said, um, well, I do, do you have a response? I was just going to say, that's a great point. <laughs> that's all. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, so, what, so what we already do is we mark deprecated APIs as deprecated, and that shows up on api.drupal.org, and that trickles down into the system. So you can see what APIs are not in fashion anymore. To, so what APIs have better alternatives that are, um, that are uh, better so to use? marking APIs as experimental would be just as important as mar marking right. APIs as deprecated. Yep. Um, I think in, in that. Uh, yep. Another thing that I said, what, what that was looking at, is I think it's really going to be important to understand how we get things, fit things into the six month release cycle. Because I think it's really important to maintain the regularity of the release. But some problems are hard. And experimental modules take 
uh, lots of time to develop, maybe, uh, if the problems are hard. And so this looks like it would be a really awesome candidate for some sense of feature branching. And uh, you've probably already thought of that, but. Yeah, we took that out of the presentation. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, so we talked, or Dries talked in his last keynote, or you know, the one previous to this, about feature branches, feature branches, feature branches. And then like, you'll notice that's not mentioned here at all. Right, right. Um, <laughs> I did notice. So there were, there were a few issues that came up with feature branches. It's not that we still won't use those, because some things are just not going to be able to be isolated in modules. Like, that's a cute, nice concept for new APIs or for like, say, brand new feature, user-facing features, that kind of thing, lend themselves well to modules, but not everything. Like, if you want to do a system-wide change of some magnitude, you're going to need a feature branch for that. The reason we go for modules as opposed to feature branches is um, a number of things, though, because feature branches, what we ran into is, um, one, you need to know Git in order to test it, which is a huge barrier of entry to many of our less technical users who are often who we want feedback from. Two is you get into this matrix of exploding testing problem where the DA already pays, I don't know, it's like 18 cents a test that's run. Now you're incrementally, like, or not ex exponentially, I should say, each feature branch is going to run all 75,000 whatever tests per feature branch, and then you kind of need to mix the feature branches and see. So it's way easier if it's all just in one code base with a checkbox. So where possible, this is a pretty good model, but we may still use feature branches in the future. And then there needs to be some work done on Drupal.org so that you can select a version number that's not tied to a, like there's just, it got real complicated, basically. Um, so it doesn't rule out the possibilities of using feature branches in the future, but I think we want to do this as far as we can do it first. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, and the final thing that I was going to say is, it's going to be really important to be clear about what's gate and what's not gate in this. I kind of second uh, Kathy's statement. It's like, unit testing is a way of coding, and if we're going to adopt it, you can't not unit test at the beginning, right? <laughs> so, um, so, yeah. <laughs> so some things are gate and some things are not. And as an infrequent con uh, core contributor, um, I got to say that it's already hard to navigate the 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 fact that there's a, a volunteer reviewers that need to be clear about what they're reviewing for mm -hmm. when they do those reviews. And we want to empower those people to do those reviews, but if they're busy, oh, I want you to check for white space. Did you run it through code or, you know, those kinds of sort of core questions that sort of throw off a newbie. I think, I think we really need to be clear to the community about what is in those gates when. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I'm definitely hearing from a lot of people, we need to really clearly indicate what's the requirement to get something from build to shipped in an experimental module versus what's required to get it into core properly. And that is definitely a detail we need to flesh out. So thank you, thank you for that. Hi, uh, I'm Daniel. Um, so I just target your point. Um, I really think testing is important. And I really think it's important for people joining something because by testing something, you actually document what is currently the behavior, mm -hmm. like what is actually like how something should behave. So I think like, especially for growing the community, it's kind of a documentation how the system works and I think it's fundamental. Anyway, I was gonna ask, uh, and thank you for the proposal, I really like it and it will especially enable people to understand that working on bugs is possible at any point in time and I think people maybe not get it um, and maybe people will focus more on it. What I was gonna ask, what does that mean for the idea to be able to release at any point in time. <laughs> Sorry. Oh uh, yeah. I've heard that enough times that I just changed that. Just yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Carry on. Okay, so I was wondering, like, what does it mean to be able to release? I mean, I don't know. We talk I, certainly in Barcelona, but especially like years, like when 2008 was started, like that we are able to release at any point in time. What does it, what does that process like? How does the process takes in account that? Because I mean, it could be that you are in a prototype state and we decide, okay, or we, we have like the RC1 and whoa, fuck, like we are, I don't know, my grid is broken or something. Like, yeah, unfortunately, yeah, if we're, if we're going back to this slide, yeah. If, if we're in um, the end of July yeah. and your thing is a core patch 
and you're really trying to rally contributors okay, to come yeah. into it, like the core contributors can at their discretion say, all right, we're going to squeeze this into beta if it's ready. But yeah, there's going to be some painful things. And there was an 8.1 as well. Like we, we hit that beta phase and it was like ka-chunk, okay? Whatever made the train is coming and everything else. But the nice thing is like before, it, when the gate went ka-chunk, it was like four years now. Go take a vacation and learn another framework or whatever. Like, now it's like <laughs> six months. <laughs> But, but I mean, I'm really wondering, like, I mean, you, you could be in a prototype state because you refine something at mm -hmm. some point in time. Um, <laughs> well, let, let him finish, and then, yeah. Like, and then, like, people went away, take holidays or something. Yeah, but if you notice, though, look yeah. at the where the 8.2 dev branch opened, right? So, so 8.1 went da, 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 and then at the end or the middle of February, we could chunk the gate, but now immediately 8.2 is open. So you still work on your prototype. Ah, okay. It just yeah. goes into the next branch. Ah, okay. Does that work? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, yeah. We, we even had this fancy, fancy version update thing on Drupal.org where it automatically added a comment. It's like, oh, 8.1.x is now closed, but okay, 8.2.x so, so, so is the open. the part is happening inside the patch or inside an issue or something. I, I mean, uh, it, it sounded like it so couldn't be. That's there's the thing. there's still a problem of things that are still prototypes that are already in core, and then how that times up. Yeah, okay, we didn't have that problem we yet. Just take the pill, like revert it or something. Yeah. Sure. Yes. Okay. Yeah. They also have their own version. Oh. Um, core experimental modules have their own separate alpha, beta release candidate, and and then when they're stable, it's just normal. Um. So right now, the three experimental models that are four experimental mental modules that are currently in core are all alpha stability. Um, they, they will go into their own like beta phases and stuff though. Um, so if it's if it's still at like a if it's still at like not even at alpha, then we would we would just like we would not necessarily rip it out of core, but it would be like hidden from the user interface. So so just on the repeated point about coding standards, like we have PHP CS rules in core, it just applies them. Just the use yeah, fixer. It's, it's, it's just right. over. And if the, 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 yeah, there's there is there is no gate there. It's just 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 do it. Just run PHP CS and be done with it. Like, okay. And if it, and if it, and if the rule isn't in there, then your stuff doesn't have to comply with it. Great. Alex, before you sit down, though, what do you think of the general gist? I like it. Yay. Okay. Thank you. You want to have it in record, though. Yeah, I want this in, in, I want to be able to refer to this as a timestamp. No. So I think I remember being the person to say that we should put them in the experimental packages. It, it, was, it was his idea. OK, cool. <laughs> so, so yeah, I agree with it. Um, the one thing that people have been saying about like the larger core API changes is if it actually did require a big, huge patch or big feature bunch, that isn't really a good idea for something that's experimental. Um, but the good thing about Drupal 8 is most things are swappable. Mm -hmm. So that experimental module, if it wanted to like say, we're going to change the whole module installer, it could just swap out the module installer and we could experiment there. So there's... Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you, you could. It, it might be crazy. But, but, but if it can't be done like that, then we probably ought to be postponing that to 9 because the focus is wrong. We, can't, we won't be able to iterate quick enough for this process. Yeah, so fair enough. Anything that... Like looks like we can't do it with an experimental module, then we shouldn't even be thinking about it really. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And if testing, yeah. <laughs> I fixed the slide. It was a bug. It's I was, now fixed. I was going to say, like, that's just a misunderstanding. Like, it's not that Angie already lost that argument, but it's just that she lives in a different. She remembers a different kind of needing to test things. So. Um, so one thing I, I should mention, if like. It is really a pain to test, then we're doing something wrong. Either Drupal yeah. doesn't support yeah. testing in a nice way, or the stuff we built is not probably done. It's more, yeah, it's done. more like if you do a really fancy user-facing yeah. feature, and then we say, now you need to write JavaScript tests for every single thing of that, they're going to be like, fuck this, and walk away. And that's I, what I I'm trying think, to avoid. Yeah, yeah, I totally think that something like a, a basic test to actually ensure that it still works mm -hmm. is, is yeah. enough. Minimum viable product. Yeah, I'm going to put that. MVP testing. 
Can we agree on that slide now? <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> there, how's that? <laughs> Ship it! Oh, I'm just kidding. It also says bypass, so not was actually correct. So, so not was right because it says bypass. No. Anyway, we are over time, so That's let's. Right. There's one really and we are way too tired. There's one really quick point, Andy. You said like we're going to design this really super complex UI, and then we we'll do a minimum bar product test it. Well, actually, that means you just shouldn't include all those extra features in that minimum bar product because you've probably over-engineered it. Fair enough, but so, you know, I don't know, like the swishy sidebar thing. If we were going to do that. It's like, that's going to be however many reams of JavaScript. And then the idea is, what I would want to see tested as a core committer personally is, does the bar swish? And does it swish out? And were there errors? Yeah. No. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Done. You know what I mean? And, and that kind of thing. So. OK, cool. I'm sure we all want to get out of here. Um, <laughs> but you guys were kind of talking about an ad hoc meeting on Friday or something. Is there a channel if it's open to everybody? Where yeah. Would it be announced on the BOF board or something? Or? Uh, Oh, God, OK. The scheduled person is in the room. Um, this is true. I, I, what? Food. Yeah. No, just in, in two minutes before we go. So I, I, like, I have all the schedule in my head. Um, so if we want to do it at a time that anyone can participate, I recommend not doing a bop because that's session slots. Um, the, there is one. It, to have all of the core committers participate, or except for Angie, who's going to be there. I could be remote, though. Uh, yeah, for sure. Actually, that would be fantastic. Um, the the time that's open to have a that conversation is is um, the the afternoon of the Friday sprint day. So if I I'm hoping like most of you are coming for sprints, you all should come to sprints because so it's awesome it's, fun. It'll just be on the sprint board. Like it'll be, it'll be a table in and that. It, I'll, I'll put it, so there's a, there's a groups.drupal.org post that has a schedule of discussions no, during the week. I will amend that to include this at, at, the, at the end of the day, so that way we can be sure that um, it, it'll be like after the live commit that the mentor sprint does, because one of the committers has to do that. So. <laughs> okay, so it's going to be on groups.drupal.org on that sheet. Yeah, so it, it, will, it will be in the general sprint room at... Um, at the Friday sprints in the afternoon, like 3 p.m. or later. And I'll put an exact time after looking, talking with the core mentors um, on, on the schedule on groups.drupal.org slash core, the most recent post. Great. Thank you. All right. That was a great talk. Woo! Thanks, everyone. Oh, yes. If you thought it was a great talk, but only if you thought it was great. Just kidding. Uh, can you go to uh, node 9866, I think that says, um, and please evaluate us. We would really appreciate your feedback.